I'm actually very pleased and honored uh, that we have the Vice President of the Republic of South Sudan who's just joined us, I, uh, Mr. James Wani Iga. And I'm sorry I'm not giving you time to sit uh, there and maybe I would like to invite you to the podium as we've all been eagerly waiting to hear from you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, on the issue of investment in our continent with about 30 million square kilometers, Africa is not only the world's second largest continent but one with the largest reserves. Reserves of precious metals and so on. Being home to about 90% of the world's platinum reserves, 40% of gold, 65% of cobalt, large deposits of iron ore, oil and gas, the continent has in the last two decades been an attractive destination of capital flow and foreign direct investment, FDI. However, the current continental economic structures do not allow Africa to take advantage of this high volume of capital flow and access to new technological innovation. And because intra-Africa growth linkages are almost non-existent, important reforms to regional and continental growth strategies are imperative. Railways, highways, connecting landlocked countries like mine and others, which are currently dependent on air transportation, will go a long way in creating a continental economy. As of today, Africa's agricultural and industrial productivity remains the lowest in the world. Hence, the only way we can collectively chart the way forward is to develop a common policy on overcoming repository of common economic challenges. We must together to challenge the perception of the typical African over the coming decades from a poor farmer or rebel to a successful entrepreneur. This calls for restructuring Africa's industrial base to raise the productivity of investments and increase the volume of returns. Intra-Africa trade in goods, services, and capital requires more flexible legal frameworks and less cumbersome and protective borders. It is a common fact that bad infrastructure and rent seeking have for long been indirect measures that have had the same effect as high tariffs and taxes. These direct and indirect barriers 
must be quickly destroyed. Starting by past tracking, tracking, full regional and economic, full regional economic integration. Equal to policy related impediments, human flight caused by negative forces in the continent such as Boko Haram, the Lord's Resistance Army, El Sabab, and others have had a significantly negative impact on Africa's investment climate. This is caused by the fragility of African states, where peaceful and periodic political transition have been witnessed in few countries, while many continue to experience violent political power contest. It is our duty as African leaders to strengthen political systems and encourage inclusive governance so as to embrace the diverse views within our respective nations. Last but not least, in the context of our continent, before I go to my own country, is the issue of service provision. The last outbreak of Ebola in West Africa was a devastating reminder that the continent's positive growth rates in the last decade have not been grassroots based. While much has been achieved, HIV, AIDS, malaria, etc., continue to claim millions of lives annually, especially at the rural areas. <coughs> Access to maternal and general health care facilities, clean drinking water, and primary education should be the benchmarks by which Africa positive growth is measured. Hence, widening the continent's economic base and redistribution of the benefits therein remain the objective uh, economic policy making uh, worldwide, especially with the continent. Let me come to my own country, ladies and gentlemen. With its size of some 648,000 square kilometers, South Sudan is gifted with lots of natural resources. But typical of continental levels, while individual countries are endowed with natural resources, the majority of my citizens remain left out from the benefits accruing to their, to their country. And as a new country, South Sudan aspires to offer the continent with new opportunities for expanding investments. Uh, through even after its independence, the country has been afflicted by 20 months of civil war. But last August, the guns have been silenced. What remains now is the deployment of the ceasefire monitors and verifiers, thanks to the efforts of the eager countries, the Troika, China, Russia, and the rest of the friends of EGAD, efforts are being exerted. We are now only waiting for the esteemed EGAD and its partners to expeditiously deploy them for us to honestly enter the next phase of peace implementation and create a conducive investment climate. The investment climate in South Sudan is governed by many factors, such as the country's expansive territory and unique location right at the center of Africa. For example, 
from a town called Tali in South Sudan to Cape Town in the south. And from there to Cairo in the north is equidistant. The same equidistant is from that same town, Tali, in South Sudan to west in the Atlantic and then east in the Indian Ocean. So we are actually the center of Africa. Uh, this, uh, the, the, the example of this huge territory is blessed with vast natural resources, of course, including fertile lands, vast hardwood forest, over 25 million heads of livestock in my country, countless fresh water linkages and rivers. In addition to this, we have over 20 metallic uh, minerals. Uh, ranging from uh, diamond, gold, uranium, mercury, and so on. South Sudan uh, subunit climate averages between 20 to 30 centigrade, at a degree centigrade, and is subdivided into numerous agroecological zones, including some of the largest flat plains in the world some of which experience almost a year-round rainfall. This climatic uh, natural endowments make the country an investor dreamland, where a wide range of economic activities, such as growing cash crops, meat production, and the supply of freshwater fish, to name but a few, could be undertaken with minimum capital injection. South Sudan is also home to one of the five largest wetlands and flood plains in the world. The 57,000 square kilometers wetlands of South region has, has seen an annual animal migration that has been compared to Tanzania's famous Serengeti migration by the year 2000. And five. By the year 2005, USAID aerial survey has indicated this. Hence, there lies enormous potential for a lucrative tourism industry in my country, which will further enrich the already famous tourist destination of East Africa. South Sudan is the third largest oil producer in Sub Saharan Africa with a current production potential of over 350,000 barrels uh, uh, per day. The country's extremely underdeveloped oil and gas industrial production beckons for massive capital injection with a guaranteed return on investment. There are over 20 minerals that have been for long mined by locals including gold, copper, mercury, iron ore, and so on. Given the central role played by legislation in determining the attractiveness of any investment destination, the Republic of South Sudan has endeavored to enact laws that are geared towards establishing a conducive business environment. The South Sudan investment Promotion Act, for example, 2009, and Company, uh, Companies Act, 2011, provide attractive incentives to foreign, regional, and local industries such as uh, easy land acquisition, company registration, income or profit repatriation, and duty exemptions uh, and anti-expropriation -ex uh, measures. Your Excellencies, in conclusion, political instability and civil war seem to be the main hurdles to Africa's sustainable take-off into economic growth and development. I'm talking from a real experience in my own country, as I already mentioned. However, while we must collectively devise systems that discourage violent political power contest, continuing in the path of development, 
has proven to be another viable means of peace building. Peace through development is not an abstract theme. It indeed leads to cemented peace. Having gone through colonialism at the same time frame, African states are facing the economic forces of neocolonialism at the same time too. We are bound by a common past and present. There is no way that any country in Africa could urge you that it will be able, isolated, to shut its fuser from the rest of the neighbors. At this juncture, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me really apologize for having come late. I am new in New York, and everything went new. <laughs> that, <laughs> that explains why my driver was also probably new to the scene, and uh, we got delayed. Thank you very much for listening. Doing business in Africa, you can't afford to be without Africa Investor.